God, this episode's getting me in so much trouble. <laughs> oh boy, that's, that's, what, that's what you get for hanging out with Canadians. The Best Laid Plans by Terry Fallis is the story of a burnt out political aide who's forced to run a hopeless campaign in a district where his party has no hope of victory. He convinces his grumpy Scottish landlord, Agnes McClintock, to stand in as the certain to lose candidate. But when a sex scandal destroys the prospects of the opposing party's candidate, Angus is elected and Canadian mayhem ensues. Hello and welcome to The Best Book Ever, the podcast where we get to know interesting people by asking them about their favorite book. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and today we're welcoming Mark Lefebvre back to the show. Mark is an author, professional speaker, and bookseller with more than 30 years of experience in writing, publishing, and bookselling. He's also one of my all-time favorite guests, readers, and friends. Mark has been pushing Terry Fallis books on me for years, and it was great fun to finally read The Best Laid Plans and talk to Mark about why he thinks this is the best book ever. Hi, Mark. Welcome back to the Best Book Ever podcast. Oh my God, Julie. I'm so excited to talk books with you again. It has been a while since we've talked on the show. We talk books all the time in real life, but it's been a while since I've had you here on the show, and I'm really excited to talk to you about this one. How have you been? How's your reading life been? You know, it's, uh, it's, it's been great. Getting lots of reading done, of course. Always three or four or five books on the go at any given time. So that's always a really exciting one. And yet, every time I listen to your podcast, I add another book to my to read, <laughs> my, my never ending story to read pile. <laughs> Mark, earlier this year, I went through a killer reading slump, which I talk a lot about on the podcast. And it's one of my favorite questions to ask people now. What do you do when you hit a reading slump? Do you have any tricks to get out of them? What's a reading slump? Really? You don't, they don't happen to you? I'm never not reading. I mean, there may be times when I have trouble getting into something, but then I just, there's so many books on my to read pile. I just move to the next one. I mean, I gave myself that permission years ago to mm -hmm. stop reading a book if I wasn't loving it. This is like being a completionist. I just, you know, I have to get to the end of it. I think I was reading for an award years ago and I had 120 books that were dumped in my, like shipped to me from the publishers. And I called up the organizer and I said, I can't do this. And he said, you're not trying to read them all, are you? I said, well, yeah. And he goes, no, if, if you're not interested, just stop. I was like, oh, like I do with submissions when I'm reading for an anthology. Yeah. If you're not liking it, put it aside. Now, that, that being said, I will also sometimes come back to a book I didn't finish because maybe I wasn't in the right mood. Mm -hmm. And there have been books that Earth Abides is an example. First two times I tried to read that book when I was younger. I mean, because I couldn't, I was a slow reader and I never finished it before I had to return it to the library. <laughs> but I think the third time I found it, I found it at a used bookstore and that's when I bought it. And that's when I actually finished it for the first time. Mm -hmm. It was one of my favorite books ever. And the first two times I tried to read it, I couldn't get through it. So I think it says a lot about the time and space you're in. Yeah. And maybe this isn't the book for you right now. Just like so many books I was supposed to have read in high school, <laughs> I came back and read as an adult. Robertson Davies' Fifth Business is a book we study in grade nine. I know Now I know why they were forcing it on us, because it's such a fantastic novel. And yet, in grade nine, I was not ready for it. But I was definitely ready for it when I was in my mid-20s. Mm. And that's a really strange thing, as I realized... It's just so hard for me to read. And yet I still re still remember just those first few chapters that I read before I gave up on it when I was in high school. And when I read it again, I was like, oh, I remember this. Americans have to read. What's the one of that annoying kid who hates everyone and it's a coming of age story? <laughs> Catcher in the Rye. Catcher in the Rye. Yeah, that one. And um, as soon as I read you said it as an adult. Kid. Yeah. And I wanted to throw punch the kid. Mm -hmm. I hated him. But I bet you if I read it as a teenager, I probably would have sympathized with him. All I remember is how this book made me feel and how this mm. character made me feel. And that is a triumph to the writer <laughs> in, in many ways. The character made me feel this. Or when this happened in the book, I felt that. Bam! That's the magic of reading. So it's interesting that you bring him up because I did a podcast episode on that. I remember. And it was my third time reading the book. And I felt differently about it every single time. I read it as a teenager. I read it as yeah. a... But you liked him better when you read it the third time, I better. remember. I hated yeah. him when I read it the middle time. I thought you're a self-righteous, spoiled little punk. And this time, all I could see was a child with depression who needed help. Oh, and wow. 
it was so fascinating to me that a book could change mm. so completely based on where I was in my life, right? Yeah. And that leads me to think I really should revisit because I am a a vowed book quitter if I don't like it. Yeah, and I yeah. rarely go back and reread them because I figure that one's just not for me. And I wonder, I, there, I really should go back and try a few. Let's I won't. At- <laughs> you, you, you will. So this book that we're talking about today, The Best Laid Plans by Terry Fallis. Can you tell me how you came across this one? Yeah, this is an interesting one. So, I mean, I've been a bookseller my entire life. I was, at the time, managing the university bookstore at McMaster University. It was called Titles. We had 100,000 trade books in store. So even though we had a lot of academic style and more social science and stuff like that, like big, big sections, there's still full fiction section and genres and stuff like that. So in Titles Bookstore, I was the book operations manager there. And I got probably an email from somebody who was an alumni. (laughs) (laughs) We'll just go with the Latin plural. Graduated from engineering there and had published their first book. And would you please take a look at it and, uh, you know, maybe carry it, whatever. And of course, you get all kinds of things like that. But because this is someone who graduated from the university and as the, as the book operations manager, I really wanted to make sure we had local authors and I wanted to represent graduates. This is a place we can showcase people who attended this university because we were there to support the university. That was our job. And so I thought, oh, okay. And then I get another email from him again. I was like, God, this guy's persistent. And, and I'll be honest with you. There was a time in my book selling life when People who had self-published a book and brought it into the store and it was like stapled together or whatever. Mm-hmm. And like, please, uh, could you carry my book? <laughs> Me being an author myself and, and loved, I was very empathetic and was like, oh, yeah, we'll give it a shot. But over the years, I, I got like, you know, nine out of 10 of these books are, I know why they're self-published, right? Mm-hmm. So I got a little bit jaded about that. And even though I had self-published my own book in 2004, so this is around 2007, And then I saw an interesting thing that Terry had mentioned in the letter, because I was like, oh, I guess I'm going to have to find uh, read the manuscript or whatever he had sent over. Maybe it was a PDF. I can't even remember, right? The technology was pretty young back then. Ebooks weren't really a thing. And so I saw that he had released it as a podcast. And I was a very avid podcast listener. And I listened to a lot of books from podiobooks.com. My walk to the parking lot on campus was a good 15 minute hike across the wilderness to (laughs) God's country. And so I had my early version of a little MP3 player. Mm -hmm. I had the no name Sanyo, whatever MP3 player, and then (laughs) sideload my stuff to it and then put in my earbuds and and listened. And I started listening to the prologue uh, of The Best Laid Plans by Terry Fallis. And as I was listening to it, now I, I previously mentioned Robertson Davies, a brilliant Canadian writer. I love Robertson Davies. And one of my favorite books of his is called High Spirits. It's a short story collection of ghost stories he used to tell uh, around the fire at the University of Toronto when he was writer in residence there. It was like a tradition. And so High Spirits is like humorous ghost stories. And it was like, oh, I love them so much. So Robertson Davies and John Irving, I love John Irving so much. And so when I was listening to Terry read The Best Laid Plans, I went, oh, my God, like almost within you know the first few pages, it reminded me of some of the elements of what I liked about John Irving and Robertson Davies. And then he got into the humorous scene where he describes his girlfriend that he encounters in the midst of a passionate encounter with someone else. And he uses parliamentary speak to describe it. And it was really funny. And I laughed out loud. And then I couldn't stop listening to it. I emailed Terry and I said, Oh, my God, this is fantastic. I've already ordered the book. I'm going to carry it in the store. I would love to come to have you come and do a book launch. Now, to hear Terry tell the story, when he talks about it now, he says, we went and we did a big book launch at the McMaster University bookstore, my alma mater, and all the three people who showed up bought books. He's he's joking because we probably had about 20 or 30 people mm-hmm. show up for the book launch. But this book was non-returnable, print-on-demand, non-returnable, self-published. I still have the original copy that was from, you know, iUniverse, who even used one of the devil companies that rip off authors to make the book. So he didn't know any better. That's nice looking, though, for an early oh, it's good. And he designed the first cover. That was the original front cover, right? With the parliament buildings and stuff like that. Yeah, that looks really nice. He's got all nice. the engineering plans of the hovercraft and stuff. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's not a bad cover, considering he did it himself. Yeah, and then, to make a long story longer, <laughs> Julie, 
He came off the book signing. I carried the book. I bought them non-returnable. And the reason I bought them non-returnable is because I love this book so much. And here's the thing. Here's the clincher. All I knew is it was a satirical novel about Canadian politics. Okay. Among things like watching golf or baseball on TV, Canadian Parliament is one of the most boring things I can imagine doing. I would almost rather stab my eyes out than read a book about Canadian politics. So <laughs> first of all, for all you listeners who are at this very moment composing mean emails about how wonderful golf and baseball and Canadian politics are, the email that you want to send that to is marklesley.com. Thank you. <laughs> I had everything working against me when I picked up this book, thinking I was going to hate it and it was going to put me to sleep. And maybe that's why I so embraced it because I said, no, I'm buying this book non-returnable. I'm going to hand sell this because I know people are going to love it. Terry left the book signing feeling kind of, wow, somebody who works in the industry actually kind of likes this book and had enough confidence that he had five copies of the book left of his author copies and the Stephen Leacock Award. Stephen Leacock was a Canadian humorist and, and writer. And the Leacock Medal for Humor is an award. And nowhere in the award does it say you can't submit self-published novels. You just had to send five copies of your book in. And he had five. So he said, what the heck? I'll send it to He's like, I've read a lot of the Leacock Medal winners. I love those novels. It's great. I'm going to submit it. And off it went. And it won the Stephen Leacock Medal for Humor. Shortly after he got a literary agent, shortly after it got published by McClellan and Stewart, which was a Canadian publisher now owned by the mega corporation Penguin Random House, <laughs> Terry's gone on to publish 12 books with them and become a Globe and Mail bestseller every single novel that he puts out. And he's even written two sequels to The Best Laid Plans uh, featuring... Oh, cool. Daniel and Angus, etc. Will you tell our listeners what this book is about? Yeah, so this book is basically about a speechwriter who had worked for the Canadian government writing speeches for Parliament, who is tasked to find somebody to run for office in a jurisdiction that has been historically and consistently a right-leaning, right-wing. You know, we use very similar terms in Canada, liberals and the conservatives, basically. And so it's a conservative writing it's always been a conservative Hang writing. Hang on. Will you explain to our listeners what a writing is? Our For American writing, listeners. It's a voting area, right? It's a geographic area where people with this postal code or zip code is, if Got you will. It. And so this is a district where consistently the liberals always lose. So they know whoever they put up is going to lose. So they have to find some sucker to run knowing that they're going to lose. And Daniel Addison, who's the narrator of the book, basically finds a professor, a crotchety old a Scottish a professor at University of Ottawa teaching engineering, but he does not like to teach, or he has to teach English to first year engineer students. And it's like the bottom of the bottom because mm -hmm. they don't read and they don't know anything about the English language and they massacre it. Then he's just crotchety and he hates this. It's like a, a death sentence for him. So Daniel says, hey, I'll teach your course for you if you agree to ride. And he says, yeah, but I, I'm not going to do any public appearances. I'm not going to promote this in any way, shape or form. Like you can you can do a pamphlet. That's it. Because they know he's going to lose. Well, the premise of it is that something happens and Angus suddenly becomes the front runner for uh, winning uh, and becoming a politician. And this is a theme that Terry consistently uses throughout all of his books so far that I've read is the fish out of water. That's very much Terry's forte. And he's so brilliant at looking at the humor in those situations. And it's almost like when you think about a classic, uh, what's the, there's the classic story where they're trying to make this rugged, rougher woman into like a lady. Pygmalion, Pygmalion. which became, yeah. the movie is My Fair Lady. My Fair Lady. It's that Ooh. kind of premise, right? And so that's where a lot of the humor from the novel comes from. Now, Angus is also an absolute genius with a hovercraft, but then there's also a beautiful backstory. Angus, even though he's a crotchety old grump, is a feminist. And Terry, as you'll be able to tell if you've read any of his books, he is a diehard feminist. And so does Daniel Addison. There's some beautiful humorous moments, but also the other thing I loved about this book is each chapter ends where there's a letter of Angus writing to his deceased wife, Marin. And it is beautiful, beautiful. So it's one of those books where you're practically in tears. And it, it won't surprise you that that was my favorite part. Oh, really? Oh, I cool. love the letters. I want a whole book of just letters because I thought that was magnificent. Yeah, They're yeah. So and, and, tender and funny. Yeah. And I thought you would like that. I thought yeah. you would appreciate that more than anything because that's what truly won me over. 
Mm. Was because that's how you got to see Angus as a real person, not as a caricature. Is right. through those letters, and there's some brilliance in that, you know, in that different perspective. Because you're like, here's this crotchety old guy who's farting and beating uh, Daniel at chess and making fun of everything he does, and you know, a crazy old professor working on his hovercraft, almost like Doc from you know Back to the Future. <laughs> That's exactly what <laughs> I was thinking too. And yeah, and there was a TV show. There was a mini series TV show. Mm. on CBC called The Best Laid Plans, about eight or nine episodes. And honestly, they did such a beautiful job. Obviously, it's an adaptation, so they changed a bunch of things. But honestly, the main character, the guy who played Daniel Addison and the actor who played Angus McClintock was absolutely spectacular. Uh, Uh, There was even a stage play done. All I know about Canadian politics is that Justin Trudeau is now single. Yeah, And I know that because he won't stop calling me which is embarrassing for him. Uh, I know. Yeah, but yeah. it's fine. I've told him we're going to be friends. But <laughs> do, you, do you feel, and I know you're not a politician, but how satirical was this? Or how closely did it hew to the way things work in Canadian politics? You know what? I think, I mean, from what I know and what I understand about Canadian politics, it was pretty accurate. Now, Terry mm. did work. You know, he did work in the in the government as well as a speechwriter. So I mean, Daniel Addison, kind of Terry, a little bit of Terry in there. So the one thing uh, I remember reading the book and reaching out to Terry and go, oh, my God, I had to go buy Lagavulin scotch because <laughs> Angus drinks it all the time. And people have brought him Lagavulin to, to book events and stuff like that. And Terry cannot stand scotch. He's just like, this is like what something an uncle of his drank. So he's like, ah, this is the scotch he drinks. <laughs> So I thought it was kind of funny because I, I remember finished reading an Irish novel from Dennis Hamill that was just set in Ireland and I had to go buy Guinness and drink Guinness right after. And I hated Guinness, but I immediately went and drank, bought Guinness after when I put the book down, like I wanted to experience it. And so when I was reading The Best Laid Plans, I went and bought Lagavulin scotch because I wanted to try. And now I, I do prefer the Macallan m- much better, but Lagavulin a decent scotch. So <laughs> No, Lagavulin is like drinking a liquefied ashtray. And I know this because I have a son who it's his favorite too. And every time he says, mom, let's have this bonding moment. And I tried it. Oh my God, I cannot do it. It is so painful to me. And I will drink it probably because of Terry, because he made me want to drink it. Well, it's what Angus drinks. And I kind of like the guy. No offense, Scotland. (laughs) I like lots of scotch, but not that one. Yeah, not that one. (laughs) Yeah, we're going to have to cut all this out. I'm going to get so much hate mail after all of this. So Terry Fallis, are all of his books politically? No. Leaning? No, just... just uh, no, so, yeah, so The Best Light Plans and The High Road are the first two books with, with Angus and Daniel. And then the third one, Operation Angus, is almost like a combination of this, and it becomes a bit of a thriller, but oh, humorous. Gotcha. And, and honest to God, a great trilogy. And again, he came back to Angus, what, 15 years later or something like that. But so No Relation is another one of his where that guy's first name is Ernest because the way they name people is based on the family name and the last name is Hemingway, but with one M instead of two. And so his name's Ernest Hemingway. He wants to be a writer. So No Relation is the thought. And so <laughs> it's just this, again, fish out of water. It's a He wants to be a writer, but he's supposed to run the company as the next male successor in line. His sister is really qualified to run the company and should be the CEO. She should get it, but he has to be the leader. But he just wants to be a writer. Oh, and it's Hemingway underwear that they're manufacturing. So <laughs> that's No Relation. Up and Down is a phenomenal novel about, again, fish out of water, an older woman who ends up going into space because Mm. she wins a contest that NASA's running to try and be popular again and then bring a civilian into space. And then what's the, there's another Well, you one have just, all of them. Listeners, Mark is holding a stack of Terry Fallis books in his hands. They're all signed, talking. of course. Paul's of course. Apart is a humorous love story where a guy has writer's block and he ends up renting an apartment above a strip club. And he can only write when he forces his feet against the pole coming up through the middle of his apartment (laughs) because it has to go all the way up for some stupid reason. And he's a feminist writer, but he can only write like nonfiction articles while the vibrations from the strip club below him. And it's this hilarious. And that was the uh, first one. I mean, I remember interviewing Terry about that one. But that, again... There's a lot of fish out of water references and there's a lot of these juxtapositions of something like a guy who can only write his feminist literature Mm. while clinging to a stripper's pole while something's going on down below him, which is sort of anti-feminism, right? So 
honestly, Terry's one of those few authors that I will buy his book sight unseen, knowing that he's the author. You and I have been friends for a long time. And one of the things I like so much about you is your optimism. And I was thinking as I was reading this, how like you it sounded, because I know you're writing so well. And it felt like it. this book, Best Laid Plans, had the satire and the humor, but there is an optimism to it. And I started thinking, I wonder if this is the main difference between Canadian sensibility and American sensibility, because mm-hmm. I had a very cynical outlook of the way this was all going to go up in flames. Really? Oh, yeah. There's that movie. I think it's called The Candidate, that Robert Redford movie where the the underdog runs for some. Yeah, yeah. And the last scene of the movie is he actually gets elected, which nobody had expected. And yeah. he's like sitting alone in this whatever governor's office and he goes what's next and that's the last line of the movie and everyone's like who cares we won and it feels very bleak and cynical and i kept waiting for those moments mm. of and then this guy set fire to this or he knocked something over and ruined canada and there's this sort of sensible yeah. practical kindness to this man that Hilarity ensues, but it never gets cynical or ugly. No, it's true. Yeah. And that's Terry, though. Mm. That is that is the heart of a lot of his books and why I love them so much, because I laugh my face off. I feel something. I learn something about myself and the world, but I never lose sight of that optimism. I, I can't say that that's the same for all Canadian literature, but that's definitely a theme in Terry's books. But it feels very Canadian to me, though. You know, when we think of Canadians here, we always think the Canadians are so nice. Right? Yeah, I Which guess. Americans yeah, maybe, are not known for that. Yeah, that, that that could be part of it, too. It's difficult for me to step outside and look at that. Yeah. <laughs> And you never would because you would, (laughs) Canadians are also not, you know, arrogant or boastful. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there was, I really started wondering about the Canadian sensibility as well, because I I jotted down authors and books. He sort of name checks in this Robertson Davies, who you've already talked about, who I'd never heard of Donald Jack's three cheers for me. I had never heard of that. And then he talks a bit about um, John Irving. Of course, I love John Irving. But I know so little about Canadian literature. I would love to learn more. Oh, Julie, I I have just from the books on the signed books behind me on the shelf, I can pull whack them off and just give you a really fun rundown of some some very just very very few of some of the amazing Canadian authors. We should do an episode about that. You want to do like a Canadian palooza? Sign me up, eh? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. There's our tagline. We can talk about Canadian books. (laughs) Okay, I'm doing it. (laughs) Okay, we will do that. That'll be really fun. I would love to do that. So, Mark, tell me, what are you reading right now? What's on your Uh, nightstand? I'm actually, I'm just about to pick up Terry's uh, latest, uh, which is a new season. It just came out. So I just finished Nicole Bart's The Long Way Home. Uh, which is a phenomenal thriller about um, a mother and daughter Instagram stars who do this travel. And then the daughter ends up going missing from a a boat that they're on. When the mother wakes up and finds it, she's gone and the life craft is gone. And and it's this wonderful thriller, domestic thriller Uh. called The Long Way Back. I just am just about to finish Steve Martin's uh, number one is Walking, which is a, a comic memoir and I bought it because he talks about planes, trains, and automobiles and working with John Candy. But Harry Bliss is the artist and the cartoonist. And so Steve Martin telling some anecdotes about his life in the movies and other oh, things. Is this and, new? And it came out just after my Canadian mounted book about planes, trains, and automobiles. And I was like, okay. oh, man, I wish I'd had this because there were a couple anecdotes I would have included in the book. But I bought it anyways because I thought it'd be great to have. And I, so reading that, I'm proofreading Death Drives a Semi, which is a book that I'm publishing uh, that's coming out in October, the 25th anniversary of a phenomenal collection of horror stories by Edo Van Belkum. Oh, 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 my God. Emily St. John Mandel. I'm reading and, I, and I'm trying to find where did I put it? <laughs> um, but it was nominated for an Aurora Award and I co-hosted the Aurora Awards with my partner Liz and it was one of the ones that was nominated this goes across time with three different eras it's future present day and it goes back you know a uh, uh, hundred or so years what's this and one called? 
Sea of Tranquility. Okay. Yeah, I am absolutely loving it. So I picked it up. I, I'd read, I think, her first novel. Like this is like four or five novels ago. Really enjoyed her writing, more literary in style. But I picked up Sea of Tranquility because, again, I bought a bunch of the shortlisted books for the Aurora Awards, partially to use as props for the video that Liz and I did. But I was like, well, I, got, I have them. They're nominated. I should start reading. So I picked up Sea of Tranquility when I was under the weather because I went to bed early and I thought, okay, I'll read before I go to bed. And, you know, suddenly I'm 80 pages in and normally I fall asleep after three pages. So, yeah, there's that. But I'll stop there because I am constantly reading uh, a number of books. Well, we'll save up the rest for our next episode, which will be oh. Canadian Palooza. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I look forward to that, eh? <laughs> Me too, eh? <laughs> okay, Mark, will you tell our listeners where they can find you and your work? Uh, over at marklesley.ca. Well, as always, I love talking books with you, and this has been so fun. I want to thank you for talking to me today, and I hope you'll come back next time you have a book to share with me. Oh, thanks, Julie. You're basically one of the first people I ever think of when I think about good books. <laughs> oh, that makes me so happy. Thank you. Bookworms, Mark was taking down stacks of books from his gigantic bookshelves and telling me about all of the Canadian writers that he's currently enthused about. And we were on such a roll that we just decided to keep recording. So make sure you're subscribed to this podcast so you don't miss next week's episode when Mark comes back for the Canadian author Palooza. Now, I want to share some exciting news with you. This podcast is now produced by Emily Zumchak of TheAuthorElf.com. Needless to say, I am thrilled about this development. Being a one-woman operation was great fun, but also a ton of work. And now I have a wizard at my side to help with the details of this operation. Emily not only handles editing and some of the social media, but will also be in charge of guest booking. So if you ever contact the show, you might even get to talk to her at some point. I'm really happy to welcome Emily to the fold, and I'm grateful for her incredible organization skills. And I'm eager to see the improvements that she brings. So thank you so much for joining me today. And as always, I will see you at the library. We can talk about Canadian books. <laughs>